So on behalf of ACF Biosciences, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, uh, which is focused on bacterial biofilms. Uh, my name is Brandon LaMarche. I'm a senior scientist here at ACIA, and I'll be serving as the moderator for today's session. Um, over the next hour, uh, we've arranged the talk in three different sections. Uh, in the first part of the talk, I'm going to share very briefly about ACIA and um, describe the Excelligence technology in detail. And the value of this is that uh, if you understand from first principles how Excelligence is detecting bacterial biofilms, uh, you'll be able to think about how it could potentially be incorporated into your workflow, even if we don't mention a particular application today uh, that you might be using. Uh, the bulk of the webinar will be conducted by Alex Mira, who's going to talk about using Excelligence for a variety of biofilm um, applications. And we'll finish off the webinar with a 10-minute um, question and answer period. And there's two ways that you can submit questions. Uh, the first is to email me directly at the uh, email address shown here, blamarsh at aciabio.com. Uh, but you'll also see on the right side of uh, WebEx, which you're logged into, a question and answer field uh, that you can submit questions through. Um, we'll do our best to cover every question uh, that's submitted, um, but if we don't have time to get to all of them during the webinar, um, I promise you we'll receive a, a response from us um, over the next 24 hours. Um, finally, if you'd like to rewatch this webinar in the future, you can use the same link that you used to uh, log in here today. So very quickly, um, ACA Biosciences was founded in 2002, and our headquarters are in San Diego, California. Um, at the moment, we have um, around 550 personnel, and our core management team um, consists of uh, deep expertise in everything from chemistry and physics to biology, engineering, and computer science. Um, we are able to sell and support our instruments uh, directly here in the U.S., and we make use of more than 30 distributors that enable us to do business worldwide. So what do we do? Uh, well, first of all, um, we manufacture the Excelligence Real-Time Cell Analyzer, which is actually a um, uh, seven different instruments, which I'll describe in more detail here in a minute. Um, we also make a very powerful benchtop flow cytometer, and something that might not be as widely known is that we are um, actually engaged in drug discovery and development. Uh, so at the moment, we have actually uh, multiple drugs that are in clinical trials um, for different diseases, including everything from uh, lung cancer to a couple of different autoimmune disorders. So what I'd like to do now is to describe for you um, the Excelligence instrument and how it works. And at the core of this technology are microtiter plates. Um, these look like any other microtiter plate. Uh, they come in a couple of different sizes. The key difference is that these plates are electronic in nature, and I'll describe this uh, in, over the course of the next few slides. But for the moment, what I'd like to say is that these uh, electronic plates get, get set inside the Excelligence instrument, and this instrument is housed inside a standard tissue culture incubator. So you control temperature, humidity, atmospheric composition, as you would in any other experiment that you're doing. The Excelligence instrument interfaces with um, a control unit and a, and a laptop that sit outside of the incubator, and this runs the Excelligence software. This is where you um, program the experiment, the, the data acquisition rate, um, do your data analysis. So to understand what Excelligence is monitoring, um, I think the best way to do that is to zoom into a single well in one of these electronic plates. These plates can be made of, um, we, we make them out of glass or plastic, uh, the bottoms, uh, polyethylene terephthalate to be specific. And uh, I'm just showing here a well immersed in uh, culture medium. And as that, uh, um, as I mentioned before, there are electrodes in the bottom of these plates. And so as the plate is set inside the Excelligence instrument, it applies a very weak voltage and this causes a minuscule electric current to flow from one electrode to the next. This measurement, um, in the absence of cells, um, serves as your background reading uh, prior to actually running an experiment. Of course, we want to monitor cells, and so uh, I happen uh, here to be showing um, mammalian cells, but uh, this works with um, 
bacteria and a wide variety of cell types. As these cells adhere to the electrodes in the, in the well bottom, uh, this is physically a much different situation. Um, cells are not naturally good conductors of an electric current. Um, another way of saying that is that they're insulators. And so there is now an inherent resistance in the system to the flow of electric current from, from one electrode to the next. Um, and this is what Excelligence monitors. It monitors how hard it has to work in order to maintain a, a constant flow of current as cells um, grow, proliferate, change shape on these electrode surfaces. And so key features of the system are that it's extremely simple workflow. Um, it couldn't be more simple. You simply add cells to the plate, you put the plate in the instrument, and you're up and running. Um, you don't uh, need to use any special media. Uh, whatever your favorite media is, you go ahead and use that. Um, it's a label-free technology, so there's no need for adding dyes, no staining, etc. cetera. Um, so a variety of uh, validation assays have shown that, that a huge number of different cell types um, are unperturbed on these gold electrode surfaces, so adhesion and growth is normal compared to uh, a plastic or a glass plate. Um, and cells are also unaffected by the, um, the electric field that they're sitting in. It's a very, very weak electric field, and the cells basically don't realize that they're um, being exposed to it. Finally, um, it's very important that the system allows for real-time monitoring. Uh, so uh, we're all used to endpoint assays, and uh, very often we're left trying to surmise what happened between the, the endpoints that we've happened to sample. Uh, this, rather than having snapshots, the real-time monitoring gives you basically um, a continuous picture, more similar to a video, um, watching what's happening as the biofilm changes. Um, another important point is that this process um, of, of measuring uh, impedance does not damage the cells. And so at the end of a, an exelligence assay, the cells are still um, capable of being uh, used in an orthogonal assay. So if you want to do DNA sequencing or run a Western blot, um, they're perfectly uh, fine for those different types of applications. The last thing I'd like to say is that the signal that the Excelligent system reports is a, a parameter that we call cell index. And this is, this is simply the impedance signal, or the resistance to this flow of electric current at whatever time point you're interested in, two, four, six hours, whatever it may be, subtracting out the background impedance um, that was measured prior to adding the cells. And so the system that I just showed you was, was very much a simplification. Um, there are actually um, a large number of electrodes that, that are um, presented in an interdigitated array, similar to what I'm showing here, where one electrode is in black and the other is in blue. And the value of this approach is that it allows for us to cover about 75% of the well bottom. And the benefit of this is that we can monitor many thousands of cells simultaneously. And this results in a, an exquisite sensitivity. Um, this is a photograph looking down into a single well in a 96-well plate. Uh, you can see the gold electrodes here. And in this particular plate type, uh, you can see electrodes are absent from the middle, and this facilitates uh, microscopy. So I'm showing here, these are eukaryotic cells, but uh, it just shows that a variety of uh, microscopy techniques can be used directly inside these electronic plates. So that's what the system does, but the question is, well, what's it good for? What can we actually measure? Well, the first thing is you can monitor changes in cell number over time. Um, in this situation here at the top where we have just a single cell, this is very different than when cells have proliferated. Down here, a much larger surface area of these electrodes is now being blocked. And so the impedance signal associated with this would be very different. Another thing that we can monitor is changes in cell morphology. Um, it's well known that um, a large number of different types of bacteria uh, change morphology uh, when they're stressed um, by environmental cues like nutritional depletion. And so changes in, in, in the overall size of the shell, the, the cell is something that, that we can also pick up on. Again, you have an area, a situation here where a small surface area is being covered versus here where a larger surface area is being covered. Um, another um, uh, thing that we can monitor with impedance is um, how tightly cells are interacting with the, the plate um, or the well bottom. And so if you look at a cell that's loosely attached versus one that's formed, um, 
more focal adhesions and is, is binding to the surface more tightly, again, those are very different situations and they have an impact on how easily current can flow through the system. And finally, um, we're able to monitor changes in how tightly cells are interacting with each other. And so if you look at a case where, where cells are, are bound very tightly to one another, this represents a much more uniform um, layer of insulation than a case where cells are, are more dispersed and are interacting with each other very loosely. And so one of the benefits of the Excelligent system is that these four different parameters represent a, a huge number of different biochemical pathways. And because of this, Excelligence casts a very broad net in terms of what it's capable of monitoring. Um, a couple of uh, different types of applications in the area of biofilm include simply monitoring proliferation or the growth, looking at biofilm detachment. In the area of drug screening, you can set up assays to look at preventing biofilm from forming in the first place or trying to disrupt biofilms once it's been established. Uh, the system is amenable to studying mono or mixed species cultures, which is very important um, as we hear about analysis uh, section of the talk. Um, quorum sensing can be done with the system. Um, bacterial or fungal biofilms can be analyzed. Uh, this is something that Alex has helped pioneer. Um, and also um, something that Alex is helping to move forward is the area of clinical theranostics. The idea that you might be able to um, take a, a biofilm from a patient, whether it be in a, de a dental setting or in a hospital setting, grow those cells in the Excelligent system and ask which antibiotic is most effective against this particular patient's biofilm infection, and then in turn use that information to guide the treatment that that patient receives. So um, just so you understand, uh, Excelligence has been around quite a while. At this point, we have um, over 1,700 instruments placed globally, and this has resulted in um, over 1,400 publications. Uh, this is a the total publication growth curve up through the end of last year. Um, here's a handful of papers. I know you won't be able to jot these down here in real time, but if you revisit this webinar, I would suggest that you uh, take a look at these papers as a good starting point for uh, seeing how other people are using Excelligence. Um, this recent paper here is a nice example looking at uh, quorum quenching. Uh, this particular paper, number two, looks at the use of phage enzymes to degrade an already established biofilm. Um, so I just wanted to give you a quick snapshot of the Excelligent software. Um, it uses a um, uh, sort of a, just a standard plate layout to um, allow you to define what's present in each well. In this case, we're using a 96 well plate. And you can set up, um, you can tell the instrument how quickly to monitor, to, to acquire data and over what sort of duration to acquire data. There's no limitations to what the technology will do. Really what you're limited by is the biology, um, what your cells can tolerate, how long the assay should run for. Um, and so uh, the system will allow for you to track um, changes in impedance over time. And uh, there's a, a suite of tools that will allow for you to analyze the, the data, uh, however you see fit. So whether you want to look at slope or, or um, generate a dose response curve to get something like an IC50 or an EC50, you can do all that directly within the Excelligent software. Finally, um, I just want to say that there are seven different instruments, and um, these differ from each other uh, primarily in their throughput. So at the low end, we have an instrument that will let you look at two plates simultaneously, yet independently, and each of those plates has eight wells. Uh, we go up from there. This particular instrument has three different plates. They're each 16 well plates. This is a one times 96 well plate, a six by 96 well plate, et cetera. And so with that, um, I've kind of uh, helped you understand uh, who AC is and what we're focused on and uh, giving you an introduction to the Excelligence technology. And with that, I'd like to go ahead and hand uh, this over to Alex uh, Mira. And so very quickly, um, some background information on Alex. Um, he received his PhD in microbiology at Oxford University in 1999. And he went on to do postdoctoral research in both the US and Sweden, um, specifically working on micro, microarray technology, uh, microbial genomics, and bioinformatics. In 2003, he started his own research group um, studying oral microbiota using omics techniques. And he is currently the principal investigator of the Oral Microbiome Laboratory at the Center for Advanced Research in Public Health in Valencia, Spain. 
Um, and here he's using um, applied uh, metagenomics, uh, next-gen sequencing, and the Excelligence Impedance technology uh, to study the human microbiome and human-associated biofilms. And so with that, we're going to go ahead and hand uh, both the, the audio and the visual control over to Alex. And um, please stick around to the end. Uh, as I mentioned, we will have time for questions. Okay, hello. Uh, thank you very much, Brandon, for the uh, very nice introduction. And also, thanks to you and to ACIA for uh, giving me the opportunity to present you today uh, the work that we have been doing in my lab in the last years, trying to set up the Excelligence uh, system in order to measure microbial biofilm growth in real time. It um, has been very exciting uh, years uh, because it is a very powerful application. Um, just a brief outline of what I'm going to talk about today after a very brief introduction about uh, microbial biofilms. I'm going to talk about what's the evidence that we have been able to gather uh, showing actually that the Excelligence system actually measures uh, biofilm growth. Uh, I'll give you some examples of single species biofilms, both in bacteria and yeast. And then also uh, I will uh, review the uh, experiments that we have done so far into mixed uh, complex you know, species uh, bi bi uh, biofilms using mainly human oral biofilms of the dental plaque where you have tens or hundreds of species. And then I will uh, review quickly which are some of the potential insights that we have been able to, to learn from these experiments and some of the potential applications, uh, going from testing uh, new drugs against uh, different kinds of biofilms to uh, what I think is going to be very important in hospitals in the future, trying to determine the individualized antibiotic treatment for patients depending on the antibiotic susceptibility measured in biofilms themselves. Okay, so uh, as you know, uh, biofilms are microorganisms uh, which are, are surrounded uh, by a self-produced extracellular, uh, extracellular matrix um, as they attach to a surface. Uh, some of you may actually work on uh, environmental samples, on these uh, maps that form on freshwater samples, for example, and some of you are going to be uh, uh, working more on, on the more biomedical aspects, uh, for example, uh, you know, mm, uh, oral biofilms which are going to be responsible for um, uh, several uh, oral kind of, di of the diseases and also some of them causing infections in uh, human implants. So whether you work on one aspect or another, the Excelligence system can be used in the past, in order to study the growth of biofilms uh, through time, we actually had to take a snapshot, for example, in this particular case, where they have studied a oral, a oral, oral biofilm through time. You actually have here a picture taken uh, between four and eight hours after toothbrushing, one day, uh, five days, or 10 days after the initial, uh, the initial formation of the biofilm. And we, we can see how the biofilm grows in complexity, but we could only have individual pictures of what was going on, but we're actually missing what is happening through the time. So this is why uh, the method that I'm, uh, that I'm talking about today actually is very important because it can show us uh, what, what are the dynamics of the biofilm and not only an endpoint uh, assay like uh, we have done in, in the past. Then also some of the past methods are known to have a low sensitivity whereas the Excelligence system is very sensitive to uh, small increases in, in biofilms that we are actually able also to quantify. Uh, it's not subject to handling errors because actually it has been very difficult in the field to get a standardized uh, protocol which is followed by, uh, by different groups around the world. And also the, uh, the current methods like, the in, uh, like, for example, the Calgary assay that we have here, you know, it needs two rounds of 24 hours each, so it takes a long time and a high labor intensive. We actually want to quantify the number of bacterial cells that we have in, in our sample. Uh, some of the, of the modern methods actually allow to label the cells in, in the biofilm, and you, you would be able also to see it in 3D and so on. But in most of these methods, actually, you lose the viability of, of the biofilm after the marking. 
and that's why I think that uh, I was very excited to see that we had um, a potential method, you know, to actually quantify the growth of uh, the bacterial and fungal biofilms in, in real time. Uh, you have already seen what are the basics of this, just in relation to the application of the of the system to uh, to to the microbes. I just want to say that uh, the electrical current does not have an effect on the viability of the cells. Uh, first, because of the low intensity, and also because it is only um, that current is it's only applied for a few seconds uh, each time that you are going to take a measurement. And if that happens every 10 or 15 minutes, the amount of electricity is very low. Um, the system, as you know, uh, as you have seen before, has these uh, uh, plates. We normally use the 96 well plates, and on the bottom of each of the of the wells, uh, you have these gold electrodes. In case that you are wondering, because that's the first question that my students ask me, is uh, they ask me whether you know we could uh, actually resell those plates after the experiment. Uh, but apparently, even though the amount of gold in the electrodes is enough. Uh, for the place to perform its function, uh, it's a very low amount if you're thinking about getting some, some cash back. Okay, um, so let's start by looking at what's the, the evidence uh, that the excellent system actually measures biofilm growth. We have performed several experiments in the, in the last few years. The first one was done with the Streptococcus uh, mutans, which is the, one of the main agents of tooth decay. And um, as you can see here, uh, the cell index, you know, the measurement of the biofilm growth, only uh, goes up in the presence of sugar. Uh, this is very common in most species that form a but biofilm. In the, in the case of H. mutants, actually, it needs the, the sugar to be able to transform it into extracellular poly, polysaccharides uh, with which uh, it's able to attach to the surface. As you can see here, uh, through time, you see an increase in the total biofilm mass as the, as the bacteria start to grow and to attach to the surface. Um, but only when they attach, you can see an increase in cell index. In other words, uh, in this particular case, even though there is no, uh, there is no sugar, the, uh, these uh, organisms are still able to grow in a planktonic state, and, but uh, that does not affect the, the signal, and we don't see an increase in cell index. So even if the cells are floating in the culture medium, and even if they go down to the bottom of the well, if they do not firmly attach to the electrodes, then you're not going to see an increase in the signal. So we are, when we see an increase in cell index, it means that there is a biofilm forming. Then also, uh, we can see that the, the cell index actually appears to relate to the amount of biofilm that we can measure by other methods. So for example, when we look at the classic uh, biofilm assays where we use uh, standard microtiter plates uh, where we use the bacteria to attach them and then to stain uh, and to measure and to look at how much they have grown, we see that when we use strains that uh, grow very well in a biofilm, we also, we also see high cell index values. And then when we see, uh, when we test some other strains which uh, are not able to attach, then we see a very low cell index values. Uh, this is in another species, Staphylococcus aureus, uh, where we see again uh, two isolates that vary in their capacity to form a biofilm. And uh, even though the difference is, uh, is not large, we can still uh, detect it in the excellence system. Then another piece of evidence that we have is when we look, when we get the same strains that they showed you before, but where we have created a mutant. Uh, in this case, a mutant for the SAR A gene, which is a uh, basic gene for the formation of the biofilm. And in this particular case, when we have a mutant, we see a, a drastic reduction in the cell index. And we, we have the same uh, for this other uh, Staphylococcus aureus strain, which actually has a, um, a protein-based uh, extracellular, uh, extracellular matrix. And um, when we have the mutant, we also saw a decreased cell index. When we use this particular protein-based biofilm matrix uh, biofilms, and we treat them with a proteinase, in this case with a proteinase K, we also see that there is a decrease in the amount of cell index because uh, part of that matrix is going to be degraded by the proteinase treatment, and therefore the biofilm doesn't grow that much. 
And then finally, uh, what are we actually, what we actually measure with the exceligence uh, we have seen uh, by the experiments like this one, which is a combination of the bacterial cells which are growing and also the matrix. So in this particular experiment, uh, we see here the cell index through time. And what we did was to collect samples at 3, 6, 9, 12, and 24 hours. And then in those samples that we took from the wells, we extracted the DNA to actually measure the number of cells that were there that we show here in blue. And we see how they increase as the cell index values increase. But then there's a point after which uh, the number of cells do not increase anymore. But in that, in the same samples, we actually measure the amount of polysaccharide. And you can see the amount of polysaccharides at the beginning is not large, but then after six hours, especially when the number of cells uh, do not grow anymore, they start to produce a lot of the polysaccharide. As you can see here, at uh, between six and 12 hours, you know, the, the cell index values uh, keep increasing, which means that the apparatus is not only uh, registering the increase in the number of cells, but the combination of the number of cells and the extracellular matrix. So I think uh, we now believe that actually what it measures is the total biofilm mass. Uh, this is very interesting because uh, it actually shows us that the bacteria first grow and then when they reach a certain uh, density, then they start to release higher amounts of the extracellular, poly, uh, extracellular polysaccharide uh, in a similar way to what happens in, a, in the form work in, a, in uh, in, in the constructions. I don't know whether uh, you have done this before, but you know, you normally put first uh, when you are going to have a roof, you know, you have first all the blocks and then you release all the concrete, uh, which then uh, gets a solid uh, roof. And I, I believe that we actually are uh, simply copying what bacteria are doing, you know, first increase in cell numbers and then to release the extracellular, poly the extracellular polysaccharide to, to have a more uh, solid and uh, more stable biofilm. Well, I have given you some examples of uh, single species biofilms from Staphylococcus and Streptococcus, which are all gram positives, but we have also tested uh, the system in uh, gram negative species, like in, uh, for example, uh, this species uh, in, in Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which uh, forms uh, by, uh, some biofilms of uh, medical importance, for example, in the lungs. And uh, we have here the cell index uh, biofilm growth curves for different isolates of this species, some of them which grow very fast, others which take a longer time, and so on. Uh, we can see here in this uh, experiment, we have here in black a control, and then uh, when we grow uh, this species under different levels of this antibiotic, mer meropenem, and as you can see, uh, uh, increasing doses of the antibiotic creates uh, more inhibition of the biofilm. So this is very important because we can actually test the antibiotic susceptibility of different isolates. We have uh, also been able to do that in uh, yeasts. These are uh, different uh, growth curves, biofilm growth curves with different isolates of Candida albicans, uh, different clinical isolates which were isolated from uh, medical implants and some uh, standard candida albican strains. And, and you can see that some of them again grow fast and others have this oscillating nature of growth as we're going to see later on. So uh, many of the uh, biofilms that we find in nature actually are not single species, but they're very complex. Uh, we have uh, done some experiments in uh, studying human oral biofilms in the dental plaque or in the, the, the ones that form either on the tooth or on the gum or uh, on the tongue. They are very important from a medical point of view uh, because uh, they are formed by different sets of uh, organisms. The ones that uh, live on the tongue are going to, uh, are going to, uh, to produce, uh, to be involved in the production of uh, volatile compounds that produce uh, bad breath. Uh, the ones that uh, grow on the gingival crevice actually are, are going to cause gum bleeding and gum, uh, gum uh, disease. And also the organisms that uh, grow on the teeth surface are going to be responsible uh, for forming the dental plaque and are going to be responsible for tooth decay, dental caries. So in order to study this, we took some samples, uh, you know, saliva samples from a few people 
uh, we put them on the bottom of the plates and after some time you can see how we grow here a biofilm. When we look at the cell index values, we're very excited to see this curve here. We can see that actually the dental plaque forms very quickly. In a few hours, uh, you already reach this uh, top, this plateau you know, state, after which a few hours uh, the cells start to detach, searching for new places for attachment. Uh, as you can see here, this is uh, very similar to what would be expected, but this was the first time that we actually were able to see this in real time and also to uh, actually check what is the time that it takes for the bacteria to attach and to form this biofilm. Even more important is that we can now collect samples at each particular time point of the, uh, during the formation of the biofilm, for example, uh, here at, at the beginning, or we can take samples you know, at the top of the curve or when the cells start to detach, and then we can gain insights of what is going on throughout the whole process. We wanted to know also which are the organisms that grow on the biofilm, whether they actually are similar to the ones in the original samples from which we grew the biofilms. So we took uh, either saliva, dental plaque, or tongue samples. We grew them on the Excelligent system, and then when the biofilm was grown, we extracted the DNA and by amplification um, of the 16S gene and high throughput sequencing, we were able to look at the bacterial composition in the biofilms. Of course, a part of the sample was used also for DNA extraction, so we could actually look at the composition of, uh, that was present in the inoculum and to compare that to what was actually growing on the system. And uh, we did this uh, for some uh, samples, you know, uh, some biofilms uh, grown coming from samples of saliva, uh, tongue, and uh, dental plaque. We have here the, the data from two individuals. You can see here a composition of bacteria in the biofilm that gets formed when saliva is used. It's more or less similar to the one in saliva. Uh, the the biofilm that is formed when we use uh, tongue samples and we, and we put them in the system, or uh, the dental plaque samples. Actually, when we do an statistical analysis and we compare the composition uh, on those three kinds of, of biofilms from the same individuals, we actually see that uh, each of the biofilms that they get formed in the exilia system is different and is most similar to its own inoculum. This is very interesting because it is not only a, a few species that get attached and that uh, grow, uh, we have a very complex biofilms in vitro which are formed by tens or hundreds uh, of species and which are most similar to the inoculum. Of course, the bacteria that grow are going to depend on the culture media that you use and whether you grow them in the presence or in the absence of oxygen, but I, I believe that this is a very good system to uh, in vitro studies of oral, oral biofilms, and I believe that it could be also tested for other kind of samples. Uh, we also uh, grew some of the biofilms from subgingival plaque biofilms, you know, growing on the the gingiva on the gum. Uh, we did this under anaerobic uh, and then anaerobic setting. Uh, you can either do this by putting your equipment inside an anaerobic chamber or uh, even simpler, like we did this in this experiment, just adding a drop of uh, mineral oil on top of the wells. This does not interfere with the, with the measurements and uh, it does not allow the entry of oxygen into your cultures. We have here samples from four individuals, and we took the sample at the space between the tooth and the gum uh, in two individuals which were healthy. One individual will have extensive gum bleeding, and another individual will have very advanced uh, state of gum di disease. And uh, what we can see here is that the shape of the curves is different. For example, in the, uh, in the two healthy individuals, we see that there is a slow growth that lasts for longer, whereas in the two individuals uh, that had the disease uh, we actually see, especially in individual four, which have an, an advanced stage of the periodontal disease, we see a rapid increase in the cell index uh, which, uh, with a very sudden, very quick uh, down in that curve. But more interesting, when we collect the, the samples at this particular, at the top of these curves, and then we sequence them to look at what is the bacterial composition, we see that in the diseased individuals we have an increase of some of the bacteria that we so see here, which are all the pathogens involved in gum bleeding and in gum disease, especially individual, uh, which was at the worst state, there is a considerable increase in some of these major oral pathogens. 
So we believe now that this could be taken as a nice in vitro system to, uh, to monitor uh, biofilm growth and to test new toothpaste uh, and oral rinse uh, active ingredients. Well, let's uh, move now to some of the potential insights and applications that we have been able to, to look at in the last years. One of them, for example, and this relates to the basic uh, science of the biofilms, actually relate to the dynamics of the growth because that varies between different samples. For, for example, when we, uh, when, we scrap, um, uh, when we take a sample from a tongue uh, scraping, uh, we actually see that the shape of the biofilm has this oscillating nature. As you can see here, if you follow the growth curve, for example, of this individual in blue, you see that after it reaches the top, it goes down, but then it goes up again and down and up and down. And the same for this other one here in yellow and the others. So that means, you know, that, I, and that only has happened in the, in the tongue samples, that uh, for some reason, this, uh, in this particular biofilm, they have a way to self-regulate uh, the growth. So when they reach a maximum and the cell density is very large, then they, uh, they must have some kind of signal or a way to, to detach. And then when the cell numbers, again, start to go down and the cell density uh, goes below a certain number, then they again start to grow, and then when the cell density is up again, they, they uh, detach and so on. So if we could, for example, identify which are these kind of mo molecules that are used as a signal for detachment, perhaps we could use them, for example, in a mouth rinse or in a toothpaste in order to prevent the formation of a mature dental plaque. And these oscillating growth uh, the dynamic, we have also seen them in pure cultures. Here we have in the left panel, for example, what happens uh, in this particular isolate, uh, where after reaching what we thought actually was the, the maximum in the cell index uh, biofilm growth curve, we saw actually that then it went down again and then up. So a similar, um, we are seeing here a similar growth, uh, that, uh, growth that, that dynamics. Uh, these lines here below is actually what happens when we add an antibiotic. And the same here in, in Candida, um, this is the actual uh, control, and this is what happens when we add an antifungal uh, drug. Here there is no growth, but uh, in the control we actually see how again we have this oscillating uh, growth that we could never see if we actually just had a standard endpoint method, because we will actually me measure what is happening at uh, each of these particular time points, but we would not know actually what is happening through time. This is one of the powerful applications of, of the Excellent system. Of course, we can also check out what happens with the effect of antibiotics. Here in the smaller panel, we see what happens in the, in the biofilm of Streptococcus, of Streptococcus mutans, which is this oral pathogen causing tooth decay. And what happens to the growth of the pathogen when we add amoxicillin, which is the most common antibiotic used in the dental clinic for the beginning. If we add it here, where the arrow indicates, we see that no matter what is the concentration of the antibiotic, there is no growth of this pathogen because it is highly sensitive to the antibiotic. However, what happens if we grow the biofilm and then we only add the antibiotic once the biofilm has been formed here at the arrow? We see that uh, actually the antibiotic doesn't do anything to the biofilm. Uh, only when we have a very high concentration of the antibiotic, we have a very mild decrease in the biofilm growth. And uh, this really shows that the biofilms is a way by which the organisms are able to protect from the external agents. And uh, when we have antibiotics and the biofilm is already formed, then uh, that's going to make it more difficult for the antibiotic to go into, into the biofilm through, um, through the matrix and therefore um, uh, for example, in the dental clinic, if we want to have an antibiotic to be effective, it would be it would have a better effect if we first uh, would be able to disaggregate, to disrupt the dental plaque before the antibiotic is applied. In hospitals, of course, we could use uh, the system in order to test what the effect of antibiotics on different isolates. Uh, the current methods are normally based on broad micro dilution, where you uh, you grow in different tubes that contain the culture media and the antibiotics at, varying, uh, at various uh, levels. 
and then you can actually see that in here the organism is able to grow, and then in here you see no growth, and therefore you could establish what is the minimum inhibitory con uh, concentration for that antibiotic to be effective. And the same if you actually uh, grow the isolates on agar plates where you can actually have these different e-tests uh, where you can uh, see where are the inhibition rings around a certain, uh, a certain concentration of the antibiotic. We uh, wanted to apply these to different isolates, uh, which are actually forming infection in medical, in many medical implants. Uh, sometimes when you, when a patient after having a medical implant uh, comes with a fever, it's very difficult to get rid of these infections because, uh, you know, you give antibiotics to the, to the, uh, to, 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 uh, to, you give antibiotics to the patient and uh, sometimes it doesn't work and the only solution is actually to have a second, uh, a second, a second sur surgery where you have to remove the medical implant and to put another one. So there is a lot of interest trying to determine what is the best antibiotic, the optimal antibiotic for each particular isolate. We try different isolates of Staphylococcus aureus and Epidermidis, uh, which account for over 85% of all the uh, biofilm infections in medical implants, and we tested 10 different antibiotics. Uh, and this is what we saw in some, I'm going to show you some of the, of the results that we obtained. For example, in Staphylococcus aureus, in one of the strains, we see here, uh, this is the growth curve in the control, and then as you can see here, uh, there are some of the levels of the antibiotic are not enough to produce total inhibition, but if you increase uh, the levels of the antibiotic enough that you can uh, reach a total complete inhibition. So this is a very powerful method because just in a few hours you can actually uh, you can actually determine the antibiotic susceptibility of each particular strain. Uh, this is what happens in a, in a more uh, you know in, in a more tough uh, isolate of Staphylococcus epidermidis. Uh, here, for example, when we test it with uh, with this antibiotic, this is uh, enough. Um, Actually, even low concentrations of the antibiotic are enough to reduce uh, the cell index values, whereas um, in this other antibiotic, only if you have very high levels of the antibiotic, you actually manage to uh, reduce the biotin growth to inhibit it. Uh, however, this is the control. When we use sub-inhibitory doses of the antibiotic, we see that not only they don't do anything to the, to the biotin, but actually they uh, are able to stimulate the, the growth of the biofilm. So we actually have higher levels of biofilm growth in the presence of these through inhibitory concentrations of the antibiotic. This is very dangerous because if we are not given the right uh, dose of the antibiotic, we could enhance the production of uh, higher levels of the biofilm. The most extreme case for this particular isolate is obtained with this antibiotic, gentamicin, where no matter the concentration of the antibiotic, in all cases, we have a very high increase in the cell index value. So we actually double the amount of biofilm when the biofilm, when the antibiotic is present. This is very important and we believe that this is actually happening in many cases where we give the, the patient a particular antibiotic, which might be fine when we test it on agar plates, but actually it has the contrary effect that we want actually, we, which we, in this case is to stimulate the formation of more biofilm. Well, what happens then when the levels of the minimum inhibitory co concentrations that we find when we do a standard test in comparison with the biofilm uh, real-time cell analysis test? We, we see here an example for a strain of Staphylococcus aureus. And uh, for example, for this particular antibiotic, uh, we see uh, that uh, we need at, at least a concentration higher than uh, 0.75 micrograms per milliliter to inhibit it when we do it with the standard uh, agar plate uh, test. However, we see that we need at least four micrograms per milliliter to completely inhibit the growth of the biofilm when we measure it with the excelligence. In this other species, another strain, in this case of Staphylococcus epidermidis, uh, when we test, for example, vapangomycin, we see that uh, a concentration of two micrograms per milliliter is enough to um, inhibit the growth when we measure it in agar plates, 
but actually we, uh, we need at least four if we want to inhibit the growth of the biofilm. In fact, if we, if we have a concentration of two, which would, would make the, the organism sensitive when we grow in acre plates, a concentration of two micrograms per milliliter actually induces the formation of more biofilm. This is why I believe that actually when we want to determine antibiotic susceptibility in isolates that are causing biofilm infections, it's actually better to use a system like this where we can determine the, uh, the best antibiotic and the right antibiotic levels uh, for the specific strains that we are testing. This is, this is the case not only in individual strains in, in, in single species biofilms, but also when we have complex biofilms like in the oral cavity. For example, in, des in dentistry, amoxicillin is the most common antibiotic used in the dental clinic. And we see here uh, the growth curve in the biofilm taken from an oral sample in two individuals. And here we have in black the growth curve of, of the control. So we see the growth uh, of the biofilm here and then uh, how the biofilm is inhibited uh, more and more as we increase the concentration of the antibiotic, at least for a few hours. What we see in this other patient is actually that no matter the concentration of the antibiotic that we add, it always stimulates the formation of the biofilm. So not only it doesn't repress the formation, but it induces a further increase in the biofilm mass. And therefore, we have here an individual which is not going to respond well to this particular antibiotic. So again, in the dental clinic where no antibiotic susceptibility test is being made, then um, it is very important to, to check what is the right antibiotic to use for each particular person. So in the future, uh, we are now trying to uh, standardize the method to determine what is the best antibiotic treatment for each particular patient, and this is in the future of the personalized uh, medicine. Another application uh, that Brandon briefly mentioned is the, the use of uh, new compounds uh, that uh, could be inhibitors of, of uh, molecules of quorum sensing that, as you know, is the, is the mechanism that bacteria use uh, to send signals to each other and um, which are involved many times in the, in the formation of the biofilm. In this particular work, the group of Anautero uh, found different molecules in a marine organism, which actually appear to be able to inhibit quorum sensing molecules. And uh, what was done here was to apply these uh, extracts uh, in order to, um, to see what would be the effect in the growth of the biofilm of S. mutants, this particular oral pathogen. And as you can see here, the, the cell index uh, got reduced in all the cases under different uh, growth media. Uh, when we added this particular extract to the cultures, even though this particular extract didn't have an effect on the growth of the organism, so it, it didn't actually kill it, but it was able to prevent the formation of the biofilm by inhibiting the quorum sensing, the quorum sensing mo mo molecules. So this is um, a way uh, by which the system could be uh, used to check for new compounds with um, activity against oral biofilms and other kinds of, of biofilms. Of course, it could also be used for, the, for testing uh, new antibiotics. Uh, in this particular case, we were testing dalbavancin, which is a new antibiotic, relatively new, which has been proposed as a promising new agent against uh, biofilms. In this case, we tested different strains of Staphylococcus aureus. And as you can see, uh, having high levels of this particular antibiotic was worked very well in inhibiting the growth of the biofilm, both in this particular type of strain, but also in a strain which appear to be, uh, uh, to be resistant to important antibiotics and which are very hard to e eradicate in the, in the clinic. And therefore, uh, you know, by using this system, we could determine what is the best antibiotic for its particular strain. And I think this could really uh, improve the treatment of the patients and also uh, try to combat the, uh, the risk of the spread of antibiotic uh, resistance genes. Um, uh, another application of the, of the method has been to actually test what is the effect of different active ingredients in toothpaste, for example, on the dental biofilm. Um, the most common used one is, uh, is, uh, is fluoride. 
uh, which is known to be able to protect the enamel on the tooth surface from the acidic pH. And uh, what we did was to grow oral biofilms in the absence and in the presence of uh, 1,500 parts per million of, uh, of, uh, of the fluoride, which is the standard levels that you would find in toothpaste. And then we have also the addition of the same amount um, of the fluoride plus 1.5% arginine, which is also another active ingredient in, in some of the toothpaste which are now in the market. As you can see here, the cell index values do not vary much. It seems that the addition of these active ingredients reduces a little bit the cell index, but not much. But then, ha ha however, even though the total biofilm mass is not the same, when we extracted the total RNA from those samples and we looked at the bacterial co composition uh, by doing high throughput sequencing of the RNA, we actually saw that we have a different set of organisms in the control and in the biofilm that forms the presence of the fluoride. There is a reduction in some of the bacteria actually producing a lactic acid and other different acids that lower the pH, and we have an increase in some other organisms which are normally associated to good oral health. So we actually see that even though it does not affect the growth of the total biofilm, it does increase the activity of uh, good organisms and it uh, is able to reduce the activity of some of the bacteria associated with the production of acid. In fact, another thing that we can do with Excellent is to collect the supernatant uh, of the culture media after some time, and we see in this experiment that in the absence of the toothpaste, there is a drastic reduction in the pH. This is where the enamel uh, of the tooth starts to lose the mineral, but however, in the presence of uh, either a standard toothpaste or, or a toothpaste with the addition of arginine, we see actually that the, the pH does not drop that much. If in addition to the arginine toothpaste, we also add Acidococcus dentisani, which is a probiotic which has been uh, shown to use arginine to buffer the extracellular pH, we see a combined effect of this species and the arginine to have an even better uh, final outcome. So by this, we can actually not only test the effect of compounds which are already in the market, but also to combine to see what would be the effect of uh, new improved uh, toothpaste. So in conclusion, uh, I believe now that the Excellence is able to measure not only single species, but also multi-species biofilms in real time. I have shown you some examples of how we believe this can be done, and uh, you can uh, download uh, uh, from the web page of the, of, of the company uh, all, all the methods that we have been able to, uh, to done in order to, to do the experiments. And uh, the system, I think, provides insight into the thing, how it forms, but also uh, how it develops through time. And, uh, and we believe also that it can be an important in vitro model to study oral biofilms in health and disease. We can also measure what is the antibiotic susceptibility, and we see that when we do that in the biofilms, the values that we obtain are different from those used in the standard methods currently used in hospitals. And uh, of course, in some cases, uh, when we add a particular antibiotic, it may not only uh, be useless against that particular strain, but also even increase the, uh, the, f the formation of the biofilm. So in general, my personal conclusion is that uh, it is a, a, a way to monitor oral biofilm formation on all kinds of biofilms. And I would stimulate, I, I, I like this talk, and actually serve to stimulate people to uh, try to apply it into other systems. So the general applications, as I have mentioned, is the search of new products to combat uh, different kinds of, of, of biofilms, both uh, in the oral and, uh, and uh, different uh, and different biofilms in the in uh, for environmental and medical applications. I think we can also test new antibiotics and antifungal uh, drugs against biofilms. And uh, I have already given you an example of an inhibitor of uh, quantum sensing molecules. And in the clinical practice, uh, we believe that this could be very helpful to determine the appropriate antibiotic treatment in medical implant infections and also in the treatment of oral, oral diseases like gum disease. So I just want to end by uh, thank uh, Marian Ferrer and Arantxa Lopez, especially Marian, who has been who has been actually the person that has been able to develop and to set up all, all the system and is uh, now starting to work on how 
uh, this event can be applied into the dental uh, clinic. I would like to, to thank the company for giving us the chance to uh, present you all this information and especially Brandon for all the technical uh, help and, uh, and, and support in the last year. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks so much, Alex. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. We've got a number of questions here. So um, for those of you who maybe haven't submitted a question yet but still have one, uh, feel free to, again, either email me directly or use the question and answer sidebar that's present in the WebEx application. So, Alex, one of the first questions relates to um, just asking if you could describe in a bit more detail how within a, the context of a dental office or clinic, how decisions are being made right now um, with respect to what's the best antibiotic to treat um, uh, periodontal disease. So is it completely trial and error, or are there other methods that are being used to make that decision? Uh -huh. Well, at the moment, in most of, of the cases, actually, it's just trial and error. Normally, they try it first with amoxicillin, which is the most common one, and then if it doesn't work, they try another one. There is, however, some a couple of methods in the market, one of them in which you actually use a D DNA chip or another one which is based on qPCR by which you have to take the samples, extract the DNA, and to measure the levels of the different oral pathogens. And then when the level of some particular pathogens are uh, over uh, a given level, then a particular antibiotic is uh, normally used, which is supposed to be useful and to be effective for those particular species. One of the problems is that the method uh, takes a few days. Also, it is expensive, so normally in the range of uh, 50 to 100 dollars per sample and then also that an antibiotic that can be useful uh, for one particular strain uh, may not be effective against a different strain of the same species so actually in many occasions it's not given the expected uh, outcome so this is why we believe that actually testing the real antibiotic susceptibility of the plaque itself uh, and by and not by an indirect method would be better, and it could also be more applied because it takes a shorter time. Great. So, so along those lines, um, something I've always been curious about is how well auger, which is a semi-solid surface, um, reflects how a biofilm would behave on a more solid surface, like like enamel or plastic or glass, something like that. Do you have any sense for how that compares? Uh -huh. It's a good question. I, I actually don't know. Uh, I, I assume that uh, you actually need to have a, a hard surface in order to, you know, to mimic what is going on on the, on the reallocation because actually we already see, for example, when we uh, look at the levels of antibiotics that you need to kill particular species, when you do that under agar plates, you get a totally different uh, outcome than when we do that on the Excellian system. So I. Uh, I actually don't have a real answer, but my expectation would be that it's actually not the same, that you need to, to grow them on, on, a solid, uh, on, a solid, uh, on a solid surface in order to be able to tell. Okay, okay, great. Um, one question that I'll go ahead and field is um, somebody asked if uh, you need to coat the plate or if the bacteria will attach to the well bottom. And the short answer is that um, you do not need to coat the plate. Um, bacteria will stick directly to either the glass or plastic uh, um, plates and the gold electrodes. However, um, the, the plates are totally amenable to, to coating. And so uh, that's something that we've done extensively in the studying of uh, mammalian cells. Um, you can coat with something like collagen, and um, that has no impact on the impedance signal, but it does in some cases affect um, how well the cells attach, and so the impedance signal can be modulated. In the case of uh, bacteria, if you wanted to look at the interaction of an adhesin protein with a specific type of uh, sugar molecule, for example, that's something that certainly could be done um, on the plate bottom. So, Alex, um, another question is, in many of your, um, in, in much of your data, it looks like the assays are really, they're, they're running out to maybe 20 hours, roughly. And so somebody asked whether assays could be run for 24 to 48 hours or even longer. Yeah, sure. Uh, you can do that for longer. Uh, the only limit in that is actually the actual amount of uh, food that is left in, in in, in the well, so it depends on the you know the amount of uh, of of um, you know 
new, new, of new, uh, sorry of new nutrients that you have left in the in the wells. Uh, normally, uh, you can even actually replace the calcium media and add new one if you want to extend it for longer. Uh, there is no limit in how much time you want to run it for. But if you don't replace the calcium medium after, uh, you know, 48 hours, uh, probably most of the cells will already be detached because there is, because there is no food left in, 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 in the calcium medium. Okay, great. Um, another question is, um, and I'll take this one, whether you can um, examine biofilms that grow at the air-liquid interface. And the answer is no, uh, because uh, the impedance signal is, is uh, dependent on an intimate interaction between the bacterial cells and the, the gold electrodes. So that's not something that uh, would, would work. Um, another question is, um, uh, Alex, does the decrease in cell index only show the detachment of cells, or can, be can it also be indicative of cell killing? In indicative of cell what, sorry? Of cell killing. So right. detach detachment versus actual cell death. Right. It is, um, it is a good question. We actually haven't tested that. Um, I would say that it is likely because it is not only the number of cells that you have, but also how strong they attach. So I would say that if part of the bacteria actually are dying, even though they are still forming part of the biofilm, I would expect that the cell index values would go down. But we haven't specifically tested that yet. Great. And something I can add is that um, just, just from our work in the area of uh, cancer immunotherapy, you can adhere uh, target tumor cells to the plate bottom and then subject them to either chemotherapeutic treatment or the treatment with immune effector cells. And absolutely, as those uh, target cells um, undergo apoptosis, you see change in impedance signal uh, very early on, even before you can detect it by other methods. And so to, uh -huh. to sort of uh, confirm what Alex just said, um, Changes in the bacterial cells will, will show up, um, and so uh, that shouldn't be a problem at all. Um, some other questions here. Um, let's see. Uh, I guess we'll, we'll go ahead and uh, finish off with this one, Alex. Um, Do you have um, any interest in <laughs> in collaborations <laughs> with uh, with anybody who's maybe in this the, the dental area? So, are you open to receiving samples uh, to then examine, or are you guys already set up? Um, do you have more than enough samples for your your current setup? No, that that would be fine. I mean, we are open to analyze new samples, for, you know, with a, some particular interest. Uh, now what we are trying to do, you know, over the next six months is actually trying to set up the system to standardize all the conditions and so on to, uh, to be able to do the, 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 management, the management of the, of the samples the same way and to standardize a method to, to apply in the dental clinic. And uh, so probably in a year from now, we, we will be in a position to offer that as a service probably to the different dental clinics where they could send the samples or we could we could uh, tell them in 24 hours what is the right antibiotic for that person. Uh, so for the time being, we don't have that uh, standardized uh, for using the daily uh, dental clinic, uh, um, you know, but uh, we are open now at this uh, time point. Uh, we are open to any, any, any collaboration, you know, that could involve uh, getting samples from different uh, dental clinics and so on or their, under different kinds of uh, oral health and, and disease. Uh, so anyway, yeah, we are, we are open to, to, to those kind of, of collaborations. Thanks. Great, great. Well, Alex, thank you so much for your time. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, I will say that there's a, a handful of additional questions that we haven't addressed, but just for the sake of time, we're gonna go ahead and, and end the webinar now. And for those questions which we haven't addressed, um, you will receive an email um, actually within the, next, w within the next couple of hours. That's um, fine. And, yeah, and, and, and also um, if, if you'd like to, um, again, revisit this webinar, you can use the same link that you used to log in today. So with that, thank you for um, attending, and um, we're going to go ahead and end it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.